Welcome to Hackbit, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hackbits. Uh, today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing uh, LifeR's founder and CEO, Dr. Andre Carell. Andre, say hello. Uh, Gaspar, thank you for having me. All right. Well, it's great to speak with you. So we're going to talk today about a topic that um, I find super fascinating and I think uh, something that's very important right now since the uh, cryptocurrency craze doesn't seem to be abating. Um, you know, everyone's getting involved in, in cryptocurrency in one form or, the, of, or another. Uh, even my, my, my children ask me, hey, am I buying any Bitcoin? But as we know, with like anything else, when something becomes mainstream and is used, especially when it involves finances, we're opening ourselves up to having issues when it comes to cybercrime. So today we're going to talk a bit about cryptocurrency, uh, cybercrime in general, and also about big Bitcoin hacking. So, Andre, first, tell me a little bit about your background. I, I, I want everyone to know and understand that you're not new to this game. So you've been you've been at it for quite a few years. Yeah, okay. been in and around of cybercrime and digital forensics and also offensive penetration or intimations for around two decades and these are three domains primarily that i try to master in my career and i end up being more now a cybercrime investigator than anything else and my uh, experience span from starting in a former government in uh, czechoslovakia former czechoslovakia primarily handling cyber intelligence type of work including crypto uh well, um, crypto hacking, but not like cryptocurrency hacking, but truly breaking the code and looking at a cryptographic uh, signal type of a decoding. I was a CISA for a little bit of a time. I was also part of uh, contracting to Department of Justice a while back at a different company where we look at the nation state threat actor intervening with intellectual property of the United States and undermine the economy of the United States and what is the significance of the impact a few agencies are asking questions that are truly related to well-being of the United States and foreign nation invading American enterprises for intellectual property gain. I was also part of a very specialized uh, agency that was part of the United States Air Force, primarily focusing on offensive missions. Uh, and at some point of a time, I just started my uh, own company with a few individuals to begin with and been doing that on a commercial market for on and around six years. Yeah, so so you've kind of seen the gamut of, of obviously crime that's out there. And I think one of the misconceptions um, or, or what people thought, especially early on when cryptocurrency was still uh, in the infancy is that it's very, very secure. So if you don't have the uh, private key, then you're safe. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, no one's taking your, your Bitcoin. Uh, and cryptocurrency in general is just a safe option out there. But I know there are, there's a, quite a few ways that uh, you can be hacked, uh, you know, from stealing those private keys, the key loggers, fake wallets, things of that nature. So tell me a little bit about some of the things you're seeing out there when it comes to cryptocurrency and, and some of the ways that um, not only on a small scale, but on a large scale, damage can be uh, caused by threat actors. Look, the wallet, when it comes to individuals, Cryptocurrency wallet, if it's just protected by the password, when it's not two-factor authentication really used into it, now nah, it's a really deadly combination. So most of the individuals who actually have a crypto, they power off a system that has the wallet. So it's not active, so you can conduct any transaction. So truly, people who are very paranoid, they, they create a, what we call a software wallet, put the Bitcoins in, and they power off the system. And even people who have like two-factor the power of their systems. Main reason is that there were multiple instances where individuals were picked their wallets and those wallets they basically compromised by virtue of threat after either trying to determine who has the wallet and then prop the passwords, brute forcing in and truly taking bitcoins from individuals. There are also nation state threat actors such as Lazarus Group, which goes after Big Fish. Lazarus compromises on and around 30 to 40 companies or enterprises that do host Bitcoins. They allow exchanges, they allow mining companies, 
different companies that maybe perhaps purchase Bitcoin for uh, some level of consumer type of transactions, and they just dump all these wallets to their wallets. Mo from our investigation that we've done at the Life First uh, and also Mangus Labs, I can tell you that something slightly over one billion a year of Bitcoin fraudulent transactions, where the Bitcoins are basically stolen and maneuver, is affiliated with Lazarus Group. That's a quite high number. Yeah, and and uh, so related to the question, uh, I think that uh, some of the things that I hear from folks is um, that, that that are nervous about Bitcoin associate Bitcoin and crypto, you know, cryptocurrency in general with uh, threat actors and, and bad people, right? So uh, there's a reason why they want to get paid by Bitcoin uh, when these ransom, you know, when these ransomware attacks do happen. So are we kind of supporting a system that's basically supporting uh, criminals? You know, so if they got paid in American dollars or some other currency, there might be some way of tracking it to the bank or, or doing some, some sort of... Um, forensics to figure out where that money ends up. When we're using Bitcoin, are we supporting something that's really supporting a criminal enterprise in general? Definitely. I would say, Gaspare, five, ten years ago, you told me that you have a hundred Bitcoins coming in and out of your wallet. I would not suspect you doing anything that's legal. And most of the companies would not even trade at, at that point of a time of uh, cryptocurrency. Currently, I would say the legitimate transactions are registered by various exchanges, and these are the broker dealers who buy and sell the financial speculators who are trying to basically leverage Bitcoin as a form of an investment vehicle. But most of the really larger transactions in the space that are in and out or are coming in are truly affiliated with cybercrime. And the transparency of Bitcoin is that you can actually see what the criminals are earning. Yes, there is some perception that perhaps those wallets cannot be attributed. But let me tell you something that's very unique in the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin world. Once the wallet is used for fraudulent purposes, let's say five, six years ago, money has to go from that wallet to some physical world or from wallet to wallet. So, for example, in Colonial, we see the group called Z Loader that was established five, six years ago in former Russia moving from wallets to wallets to actually dark side wallets. Hmm. And these are almost like an investors, people who put putting money in. One of the reasons why they can really take the money out of these Bitcoin wallets is that they truly worry that if they went to the exchange, the exchange would bust all the funds and would not give them a penny from it. Right. And right. basically will seize all the money they actually earn. So the, good, so the advantage of the ecosystem is that we kind of know which wallets are criminal because they connect each other at some point of a time when these criminals are trying to do something with it. The challenging piece is when these cryptocurrency wallets go directly from a criminal to, let's say, Monero on some of the exchange. So they don't touch anything else. That's challenging. But if the wallets are connected, then we actually see the criminal ecosystem and how they maneuver each other. That's something that you would not get from a banking system because when banks do operate among each other, exchanges are not that good in terms of sophistication. How these criminal rings, for example, uh, drug cartels actually do operate. It's not easy. You always have to find the traces, wires, going through it, mules. And it's actually more complicated to find true drug criminal rings, how they operate in their cash, as it is working with the, crypto, with the criminals who operate in the crypto world. Because it's all interconnected. All these wallets are interconnected, truly, at some point of a time. Uh, another one is that once we know some of the individuals, then we make the attribution. So, for example, the criminals are used to like criminals. It seems like, like a drug dealers. They continue to do their career. So now the attribution is actually easier. So federal law enforcement around the world, and we, we as our lifers and Mongoose Labs, attended a conference in the Hague. Almost 300 agencies actually contributed to this very central database, almost something similar to the Interpol, where the tracking actually does happen. Exchanges of what wallets do we know are actually criminal. 
So while the criminals are really thinking that maybe they can stay behind the scene, uh, it's not it's not necessarily true. Also, there is something called mixers, and mixers are tools to mix it up so you can't really trace it. And one of the mixers was actually operating by Europol and FBI. Agents created their own mixer and lure all the criminals just to see all their transactions and all affiliations with their wallets. And that was the first spawn, and it was in 2016, where we truly documented networks of criminals that they would never understood if not Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a great connector of criminals and it can quickly pinpoint where these criminals are. And also finally, we do have an understanding of what they're making. We couldn't do that before, but now we, we, for example, have estimates that, let's say dark side group was on, on around 150 million, right? So, so we, now we have understanding of what these criminals are truly making and what kind of capabilities they build. So, so as far as uh, I, I, the, the big, uh, Bitcoin mixers, I think I, I think I heard them as tumblers. I think it's the same the same thing at, at one point. So, what what can be done to kind of combat all this? I mean, I know that the the law enforcement in the United States and, and companies like uh, like ours are are doing their best to uh, combat um, uh, criminals. But is it, is this a battle that we can win? Is it, is there is there is there a light at the end of the tunnel, or is it just going to get worse or more complex, or is it just here to stay? Because the Bitcoin as, as a as a product seems to to be still uh, the last count. I think it was thirty thousand or something uh, Bitcoin. I can't remember what it was trading at, but it's not going away. And and I I'll have to admit I was one of those people that thought this was a, some sort of fly by night. Um, you know, it's never gonna it's never gonna take on. Um, but I think it's here to stay. So what are some of the things that can be done you know, to combat the money laundering or, or even, even how hackers use it uh, when it comes to um, uh, ransomware situations? So what, what is really happening, I would say, behind the scene and what the trade actors are now experiencing is that the exchanges started secretly cooperating with the federal law enforcement around the world. And I think we are getting actually upper edge in finding the crime. Like no one really wants to pull the trigger because the if if we start openly advertising that the Bitcoin is starting to be traceable and interconnected, mm -hmm. criminals also will convert to different techniques. Right. But the um, fact that for example Marco Bransomware and some other ones are using Monero is a sign of that. Meaning it's a sign that the criminals are understanding that having Bitcoin wallets will actually point to them and they will be not able to cash the money out of the wallets. So it's not going to be exchange where they can actually go and get the cash out of the exchange. And that's a problem. It's going to, it's going to be a problem for them. Um, so I do think that, it, that the more sophisticated group are going to shift to something more secure and safer for them. Um, and then the rest of it's going to, it's going to follow. That's going to be more problematic. But right now, I, I, I think the criminals are really naive when they believe that the Bitcoin is not going to be traceable or their right. transactions are not going to be covered. Yeah, well, look, I appreciate your time. It's interesting. I, I think fiat currency, for example, there's about $1 trillion uh, laundered uh, in fiat currencies at any given time. And now Bitcoin still has a little ways to go, but I, I think that um, uh, if, they, if they keep at it and, and, and these uh, threat actors keep doing what they're doing, it's going to... Um, create a problem that uh, this beast that's going to be uh, unfixable. But like you said, if they're being naive, if they believe that um, that it can't be traced. So any, any uh, parting thoughts when it comes to, um, to uh, cryptocurrency in general and, and uh, what uh, companies like, like Lifars can do and Mongo Labs to aid in, in protecting and, and also, um, you know, working with ransomware victims. Mm. It's important to understand when someone has cryptocurrency that on enterprise level, cryptocurrency wallets were never resi designed to create very secure banking systems. Yeah. Cryptocurrency wallets are not designed to be your bank, meaning the company has to set up all procedures and protocols and also process how these multiple, sometimes we call them cold and hot wallets, do operate and how they are distributed. Also in the blockchain, there must be like, let's say like a front end door 
front end wallet that collects information and provides the payment information. And then maybe at the back end are the wallets that, let's say, are not accessible, they're actually being shut down, they're called. So truly just the computers where Bitcoins are transferred is shut down, like literally shut down, meaning they're not even operational, that even people who uh, need to use them have to power on the systems and get into, get into those wallets. That's something to keep in mind. And what we've seen from our clients and some companies that we work with is that testing the systems regularly have a good incident response process where the threat hunting is conducted, who is perhaps targeting and focuses on these enterprises is very vital. And naturally, there are a few predators like Lazarus in the cyberspace that will go and make touch points with these cryptocurrency companies. Once someone has a Bitcoin, that's the commodity that these groups actually do want. And they n do not make a mistake. They will make a touch point. That's how they operate. So having great internet response plan, always be paranoid and conduct some threat hunting. Regularly test your systems are probably the best tools that any enterprise can use to defend and potentially prevent being a victim of cryptocurrency crime. Great, Andre. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, taking the time to explain it. And you know, this is a, uh, a hot topic, and maybe we'll we'll talk again uh, and we go into some uh, some other details regarding the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin uh, wave that's 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 hitting this this country and the world for that matter. So thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gaspar, for having me.